All right, guys, welcome to RC Mojo. This week, we're going to put together and fit the Tamiya Electric Actuator Set for the Wrecker. It's a really high quality piece of kit, which it would need to be as it costs quite a bit. It's also worth noting that it really is a kit. A couple of my friends who've built a Wrecker were a bit surprised when they opened the box, but it's almost all very straightforward with only a couple of minor tripping points. Right. In the box we have a good old fashioned Tamiya blister pack, no doubt partly to pad out the contents of the box, but I do like a blister pack. It shows off the machined aluminium gear cases and the motor with gear reduction, all super high quality. There won't be any of that off brand iffy fits and clearances, it's all going to fit together perfectly. We'll remove these bits from the packing now to save a bit of space on the bench. We just need to carefully cut the plastic and pop the parts out. Next up we have the box. Inside we find a nice looking set of parts bags. Again, I know in the end the presentation doesn't really matter, but I do like the experience of a nicely packed kit, rather than just a big box with everything just chucked in. In the first bag we have the actuator rod, lead screw, motor plate and some grease. Next up, there's the tube the rod runs in with its cap. They're metal and feel far too weighty to be aluminium. I think they might just be steel. Either way, it's a really nice part. This one has lots of screws, a metal gear, oddly a small screwdriver, so there must be some tiny screws in there somewhere. Also, there's a gate for the transmitter stick, along with some zip ties and some servo tape. Next we have the wiring, which isn't anywhere near as bad as it looks. This is the ACU-02, the controller for the lift. It handles the limit switches and can run a couple of LED beacons. And lastly, there's a bag with some plastic spacers and a plastic gear. Back to the main box, we have the paperwork. First we have some stickers, mostly cable identifiers, plus the stickers for the ACU-02. Here's the standard yellow sheet of dire warnings that nobody ever reads. But this yellow sheet is a bit more interesting. It has some advice on towing, which is quite handy. It's all really common sense, but it's nice to have. And then we have the manual, which on first glance looks rather big with lots of pages. Until you notice there's only about 10 pages of use instructions, just in several languages with the build manual at the back with all the diagrams. Still, it's laid out very well as usual. You might end up needing to read some of the text a few times to get your head around the Tamiya stick stirring, trim fiddling and button presses, but it's no worse than the MFCs, plus we'll have a quick look at the setup at the end of the video. Before we get started, we're going to need to open up the bag with the screws in and empty out the small bags into some pudding pots. There's lots of very small parts in there, some steel balls and small clips, so be careful. Right, here we go then. Step one, the lead screw and gear. We'll need the lead screw of course, the plastic gear, the bearing carrier FF1, a 4mm C-clip and an 1150 bearing. Also, we're going to need some grease, but instead of opening up this tube, I'm going to use some leftover from other kits. It's the same ceramic grease, so it's going to work just fine. First then, we pop the bearing into the carrier, squeezing it in until it's flush. Then we add some grease to the lead screw between the screw thread and the first slot. Pop the bearing on, and we're going to add a bit more grease. It shouldn't really need it, but if the clutch slips, it's not going to hurt. Then the gear goes on with the hollow clutch side facing outwards. And now the tricky bit. We need to get that C-clip into the slot inside the gear. You can position the clip with some tweezers, then you need to press it in so it snaps over the slot. It's a bit like installing a really stubborn E-clip. Some pliers with a really fine tip work pretty well, or if you're careful, a small flat-headed screwdriver will do the trick too. Step 2. The clutch. We need the well-named drive core. Unfortunately, it's not quite as exciting as it sounds. It's just a plastic part with a few springy bits. There's BB5, which will adapt the lead screw to the square drive for the drive core. Then we have three steel balls and a four millimeter E-clip. 
To assemble, we need to press BB5 down into the end of the lead screw with the round end towards the gear. It's a metal part and a fairly tight fit, so you have to get it in just the right spot and make it go in straight so it doesn't get hung up. Next, we need to grease up the inside of the gear so the clutch can operate smoothly if it ever needs to. Then for the tricky bit, we need to insert the balls. The idea is we sit the drive core over the gear and pop the balls in, then push it down so it interlocks. I found this to be an exercise in frustration. I'd get one or two in, then by the third one, one of the other ones will have moved. Instead, I remove the drive core, which is now covered in grease, and simply pop the balls in where they need to go, using the grease to keep them all in the right spot. Then I very carefully offer the drive core up to the gear, lining the balls up with the slots, and pressed it into place. Still a bit tricky, but it did work. The last thing to do is clip in the e-clip into the slot at the end of the drive core. It just needs a squeeze with some pliers. Step 3. The motor plate. This time we need the motor, the motor plate, three M3x5s, the rather large pinion, and a M3x4 grub screw, which we're going to install right away. Now, because we'll never need to open the actuator up again, we're going to use Threadlock. The kit comes with some gel, which works fine, but I prefer using a liquid Threadlock. Same effect, just a bit easier to use. We just need a little spot on the grub, then we can spin it into the pinion a turn or two so it's ready to install. The motor gets installed with the three screws. Now, it's important to note which of the six holes we want to use. And we need to set the motor so it's at the right angle with the terminals across the plate rather than vertically. We'll start with one screw just to get the motor lined up. Then we can install the other two with a little bit of thread lock, just taking up the slack. Next, we remove the first screw, add some thread lock and reinstall it. Then we can go around and nip all the screws up properly. This will make it all come together nice and straight so we won't have to faff around trying to get things lined up. Next, the pinion goes on with its teeth towards the motor plate. We want a small gap between the end of the motor and the pinion, or if you want to be extra sure, you can measure 15 millimeters from the outside of the pinion to the motor plate, but it's really not that critical. Step four, gearbox cover A. We need the lead screw assembly, two M3 by sixes, an 1150 thrust bearing, and when we get to it, the larger of the two gearbox covers. The lead screw assembly drops into the motor plate so the bearing carrier fits into the hole and the gears line up with the pinion. We're going to be generous with some grease here, just because we can. Any excess is going to get flung off the gears when it spins up, so within reason the more the merrier. Then we slide on the thrust bearing and we offer up the cover. To keep it in place we use the two screws at the narrow end of the motor plate. We will use some thread lock, but for now, we're just going to leave the screws loose. We'll tighten them up when we get all the other screws in later. Step 5. The rod. This bit has the trickiest part of the whole build. Right, well, we don't need many parts, just the rod, the collar FF7, and an 8mm circlip. On the end of the rod, we slide on the collar, then we simply clip the circlip on the end. Sounds simple, and if you've got yourself a small set of circlip pliers, it's going to take you two seconds. If, like me, you don't have a small enough pair, you're going to need to get a bit creative. Essentially, we need to get something into the slot to open it up to spread out the clip. After a few tries, I ended up using a straight-ended pair of tweezers in the slot, then using the wrong end of another pair of tweezers in the first, so you can twist them to open the clip and slide it over the slot. Still a bit of a fiddle, but it did work, and was a bit of a relief when it went in. A small pair of circlip pliers would have made it so much easier. With that done, we can grease up the lead screw and thread on the rod. As it goes on, you'll want to mop up some excess grease so you don't make a mess. As it goes on, you're going to want to mop up the excess grease so it doesn't make a mess. As an initial setup, we want to thread it on so there's 25mm between the end of the rod and the motor plate. This should let us install it on the chassis without having to worry too much about it being just the right length. Step 6. The cylinder. We need gearbox cover B, the cylinder, and four M3x5s with low profile heads. 
The end of the cylinder has two flats which line up with flats inside the cover. So when you insert the cylinder, spin it until it drops into place. Then to double check, look down the screw holes and make sure you can see right through them. Then it's just a case of add some Loctite to the screws and thread them into the holes around the cylinder. As usual, start with them all slightly loose, then once they're all in, nip them up. Nice and simple. Step 7, bringing it all together. For this one we need the gearbox and cylinder assemblies, four M3x8s, and for the second half of this bit we need a FF3 spacer and the end cap for the cylinder. To assemble we first need to grease up the collar on the end of the rod. We'll also grease the rod up a bit too just for good measure. Now we can offer up the cylinder sliding it over the rod until the covers up against the motor plate. It will only fit one way properly as there's a recess that fits around the bottom of the motor. So if it won't go on spin it around until it does. Next we install the four screws with some thread lock so we attach the cover to the plate. Just like before we install them all loosely then nip them up along with the two from step four to bring it all together. And for the last bit we need to squirt some more grease in the end of the cylinder around the rod then insert the FF3 spacer. And to finish the job we thread on the end cap doing it up about as tight as you can by hand. And what we're left with is a rather nice and very solid actuator. Almost all metal it's probably going to last forever. The next few pages involve dismantling parts of the truck to gain access for the switches and all the other bits, but we're installing this one during the build, which does make things a whole lot easier. So we're going to step in at step 5 of the installation, removing the stock rods. But we'll also be installing the actuator so the arm isn't flapping around in the breeze. At the moment we have the two rods installed on the chassis which need to be removed. They're attached with the two pins and body clips. So all we do is remove a clip from the top and bottom pins and pull them out. To fit the actuator, it helps to have the arm supported in an elevated position. Popping a pudding pot under the end to lift it does the trick. Now we can offer up the actuator and push the lower pin back in so it runs through the actuator and out the other side of the chassis. Then we pop the clip through the hole in the pin. For the top mounting we need to use a different hole to the stock rods. Check out step 8 for the diagram which tells us which holes to use. Otherwise it's just a case of getting it lined up and passing through the pin. And just like the other one we need to pop the clip back in the hole. A nice simple install. The next bit we've already seen in a video, step 6, installing the up down override switch in one of the rear storage boxes. First we need to remove the outside nut and shape proof washer from the switch. Then we can adjust the inside nut so when it's in the mount there's just enough thread exposed for the washer and the outside nut. Pop the switch in, install the nut and nip it up. Then we can install the mount on the inside of the box with the screws from the wrecker kit and build up the rest. Adding the hinges and all the other bits as per the manual. Step 7, the lower limit switch. We need the mount U3 from the actuator kit, two M2x10s, two 2x8 self-tappers and one of the micro switches. The first part is very straightforward. We just need to attach the switch to its mount with the two M2x10s. It'll only go on one side and it's pretty obvious from the diagram which way round it should go. We're using machine threads into plastic so watch out for over tightening. Besides, it's just a limit switch, it should never be under all that much stress, so the screws only need to be tight enough that the switch can't wobble around. Next we remove the lower pin from the actuator again, so we can lift the arm way up and prop it up with a pudding pot. Which gives us good clear access at the rear to install the switch. It fits in a small slot in the rear cross member and gets installed with the two self tappers. It's a bit fiddly, but with the arm up out of the way it's really not too bad. Now we just need to route the wire somewhere vaguely sensible and we reinstall the pin and clip at the bottom of the actuator. Step 8, the power cable. Also the actuator install, but we've already done that. While we install the power cable we'll use the Y harness too just to keep the end of the cable tidy and so we can't accidentally pull it through from the other end. For now we'll just run the cable in through the front box and along the chassis. We'll tidy it up later when we go over all the wiring to make it neat. 
Step 9, the upper limit switch. For this one we need a 3x10 self tapper, two M2x10s, the U2 mount and the second micro switch. Just like the lower one, the switch is attached to the mount with the two M2 screws. This time it's got a bit of a recess to sit in, so you really can't get it wrong. Well, I suppose if you really worked at it, you probably could, but that would be daft. Next, the switch mount offers up to the inside of the middle box on the right of the chassis. The mount has a cross shape on one side that fits corner to corner in a square hole to keep it all lined up. To attach it, we just need to thread in the 3x10 from the outside. I found it a lot easier to do with the lower pin from the actuator removed again, so we can lower the arm a bit for a bit more space. It's all a bit tight in there, so any extra clearance you can get does help. Next, the rear box goes on the chassis, as per the wrecker manual, using some machine screws to attach it to the brackets. So that's all the mechanical sorted. Next we've got the rather blank looking ACU-02. As usual for Tamiya Electronics it all looks pretty good with a nice chunky power connector, small connectors for the switches and unfortunately a hard wire connection for the motor and receiver. Could be better but once it's installed none of that really matters as long as it makes the lift go up and down. To jazz it up a bit we are going to stick on the stickers no idea why Tamiya didn't do it themselves, but it's really not a big deal. We just peel them up, use a clean knife blade to position the sticker, then stick it down. Repeat with all three and we've got a much more informative box of tricks. To connect it all up, we plug the toggle switch into J1, the upper limit switch into J2 and the lower into J3. Then we connect the battery lead to the big connector on the ACU and the motor connects to the connector on the end of the wires. For testing I'm going to use a servo tester to tell the ACU what to do. We can use the dial to see how it all works without the extra complexity of having to set up a radio. The ACU doesn't have a power switch so as soon as we connect the battery it comes alive and starts flashing its red LED. Which makes sense because the ACU won't be powering the servo tester. We need a receiver battery to power it up. Immediately the ACU sees a signal and the light goes green, which I assume means it's happy. If we turn the knob to change the signal, like flipping a three position switch on a transmitter, we can see the arm starts to go down. Just for fun, we're gonna let it run until the limit switch triggers. It's a bit slow, but you can hear the actuator runs really, really smoothly. Well, when trying to make the arm come back up, it wouldn't go. After some fiddling, I found the upper switch had got caught up, so the ACU thought it was already at the limit. After a quick refit, everything seemed to work perfectly. Not a bad outcome to have all this put together and only have one very minor niggle. Tamiya quality at its best. Now, you could leave it at that, connect up a radio, and it will almost certainly work just fine. But to get the best from it, and to access those extra lights, we are going to need to calibrate it, or teach it as Tamiya put it. I've set up a three position switch on the transmitter, we've got up, stopped and down. Plus the switch next to it acts as a plus trim switch. So if I set it to move the lift down, you can see the top right bar move. Then, if I add the plus trim switch, it moves a bit further. As far as the signals the ACU gets, it's going to think we've moved the mechanical trims all the way and moved the stick too. The first thing to teach is the normal movement without trims. What we do is hold the button down until the red LED starts to blink slowly. Move the switch up to the top, then all the way to the bottom. The green LED should start to flash if it thinks it's okay. Then we push the button again to store the calibration. Now we pretty much do exactly the same thing again, but this time we need the switch for the plus trims turned on. And we keep the button pressed until we get a double flash on the red LED. Then we move the lift switch all the way up, then all the way down, which should make the green LED flash. Then we press the button to store the calibration. Now this isn't quite how it's written in the manual, but it does seem to work just fine. As you can see, the lift switch is making the lift go up and down quite happily. If we connect up two yellow LEDs to the ACU's J5 and 6, 
flip the plus trim switch and hold the lift switch up for a couple of seconds, the LED starts to fade in and out. Quite neat, and if I remember correctly, bearing in mind it's been a while since I recorded the footage, when you get errors with the ACU, the LEDs connected to J5 and 6 will flash alongside the ones on the ACU itself. It could be very handy if there's ever a problem. You're going to notice the lights flashing long before you think to check for the ones hidden away in the box. Other than that, the ACU has a power mode setting for your typical 6L NIMI, standard mode, an AA pack of some sort, or battery failsafe mode. There's not really much detail as to what the others do, other than you should only use standard mode with this kit. I'm guessing where the ACU is used in other products, you might want to change it. You can also adjust the dead band for the lift control and return it to factory defaults. All quite handy, but all being well, you should never need to mess about with them. And well, that's about it. It's a fairly expensive kit of bits, that's of limited use. But if you use it as it's intended, it does work flawlessly. We haven't tested it to its limit, but playing around it'll lift any 1 14th truck without breaking a sweat. So, as is often the case with the higher end Tamiya kits, it's 10 out of 10 for quality, but 5 out of 10 for value. Right, well, that's it for this week. Not sure what's happening next time, other than it's going to be truck related. As always then, thanks for watching, like if you liked, subscribe if you haven't, and leave a comment if there's something on your mind. Bye guys! Thank you.